What do you believe is the secret sauce to sustainable weight loss? There's this evolutionary mismatch where our brains still think that there's food scarcity, but yet there isn't. You don't have to go on a treatment just because it's there. There are other options other than Ozempic. They're meant to be long-term treatments. They're not cures. This medication is going to help you lose weight, but will that change anything about the way you see yourself? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Okay, this is going to be a hot topic that we've never really covered <laughs> in the groups before. And today joining me, we are so lucky, y'all, to have this guest with us today. She is a world-renowned leading expert in obesity medicine. She's also an MD. She's a diplomat diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. She's the founder and medical director of Haven Weight Management and co-founder of Three Sales, a program focused on mental resiliency and weight management. My name is Sandy Van. I'm a trained family doctor, um, but I've never practiced in family medicine beyond my residency training years. I, I've only ever practiced in obesity medicine and mental health. And the reason why I specifically chose this focus was because I just felt like we weren't as family docs um, doing the work of addressing the weight related concerns beyond the antiquated messaging of just eat less, move more. I think the message has changed a lot more, like a lot differently now that uh, many years have gone by since I graduated residency. But our offerings were really limited at that time. And family docs have just so much to know and understand about medicine that I felt like I want to become a master at actually addressing the one thing in people's lives that permeates all aspects of their lives. To me, that's really ahead of the game, but obviously you've been doing it for a while. So let's talk about before pre weight loss medications. Yeah, um, I mean, it's amazing that we have access to them. I'm actually not opposed to them at all. I think they can be an absolute game changer for people. It's really exciting. But before we got into that conversation, let's talk about the fact that you were, you were understanding there was more to weight loss than eating less and exercising more. What did you think of the diet industry? Did it not just make you mad? Well, my first exposure to doctors who were actually managing uh, weight loss were some of them were associated with the diet industry because the the advice that they were providing patients was themed on specific diets, whether they were keto or yeah. um, just counting calories. And I remember talking to a supervisor and I was saying, I really want to help people with weight loss. I think that that's an important part of medicine. And she said, well, why didn't you just become a dietitian? And so that's just to give you an idea of the culture at that time. Um, and it wasn't until I met somebody uh, named Dr. Sean Wharton, who's actually a pioneer of obesity medicine. Like you introduced me as a world renowned expert like that. That to me, he is a world renowned expert in this field. And he told me the first thing he said to me was, if you want to understand obesity, you need to understand the medication piece. And that was my first exposure to obesity and the science behind it, how hormones and biology and the brain are actually driving a lot of this, these weight problems along with our environment. But it wasn't really simply about what people were consuming. There were a lot of, there was a lot of things that were influencing the way people consumed and what the, those types of foods were actually doing to our brain and the conditioning processes that were occurring. We try to focus on awareness, um, yeah. you know, especially what's happening mentally with issues and associations tied into food, with habits, beliefs, some people past traumas. What yeah. do you believe is the secret sauce to sustainable weight loss? I think that yeah. everybody's different in why they have excess weight. Um, you've already mentioned a number of things uh, that can influence somebody's uh calorie consumption, uh, early adverse childhood experiences, for instance, traumas, those are things that can really influence somebody's self-evaluation. So if you think negatively about yourself, you're more likely to also absorb a lot of the weight stigma and societal culture and, and yeah. sort of just have that um, intrinsically believed. And then that affects the way you feel when you eat, and then you feel negatively about how you eat if you're not doing it right. And, and so so I think that it can be really complex from a psychological standpoint. Mood disorders can also influence it because somebody who might have depression or anxiety, it could be sometimes at times, depending on the severity, really paralyzing and make it harder for you to self-regulate. And a lot of weight management and like structuring meals and meal planning, all those things requires a lot of 
one, motivation, and yeah. two, um, willingness, and three, attention to understand when these like thoughts and feelings are coming up. Like you mentioned, self-awareness is a really important piece, right? So, so I think that when you start honing those skills, that self-awareness piece, but also understanding the biology of the fact that when you lose weight, when you lose a lot of weight, especially your brain is, has this biological imperative to want to regain. And how does it do that? It increases your hunger, it decreases fullness, it slows metabolism. And it doesn't mean that it's hopeless to sustain weight loss on dietary interventions. I've seen it happen many times before, but I, I, I think that it's important to acknowledge that there are just some pressures that people might face that make it harder to sustain long-term. And so they got to find, going back to the message, you have to find what you can sustain long-term and that you can reasonably enjoy so that you can recalibrate and that's your new default. People feel like their body hates them. Their body hates them. It's oh no. That, trying to screw no. them over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that your body doesn't hate you. Your body doesn't hate you. Your brain's just doing what it was designed to do, right? We... Our ancestors, if you, you, this is where I have to talk about the hunter gatherer and some people glaze their eyes over when they hear me talk about it, but it's actually true that your brains are no different now than they were um, when, when it evolved, your brains evolved. Our hunt, our ancestors lived in an environment of food scarcity. So it makes sense that our brains are hardwired to seek out calories, to survive, uh, to seek out uh you know, sedentariness and comfort and sedentariness to conserve energy in, eff in an effort to conserve energy for that next big hunt um, and to seek out pleasure, pleasure, whether it was from sex so that we could proliferate offspring and, you know, yeah. build out human like human community and and all those things like these are all primal hunter gatherer drives. There's nothing wrong with your body. It's just that we are now plopped in an environment and there's this evolutionary mismatch where our brains still think that there's food scarcity, but yet there isn't. So it can't distinguish between the calories that you're getting from pizza versus the calories you're getting from um, like an apple. An apple has less calories than pizza. So why not have the pizza, especially if it's going to give you that, that pleasure and that pain relief. Cause that's what yeah. it does when you eat ultra processed food that has this really unique combination of salt, sugar, and fat it elicits this reaction in the brain and that reward center of the brain that releases opioids. Opioids are produced endogenously in your body, but they're also, if you think about opioids, we've got opioids, you know, outside of our body too, that have been produced like morphine, fentanyl, like all these things. What do those things get prescribed for? Pain relief. But we make that ourselves when we actually consume ultra processed food or substances um, um, of abuse, right? So it makes sense that your brain would naturally like it and learn to get more of it. And that's where the conditioning occurs, where that slice of pizza might not do the same thing for you next time. You might need a little bit more. It might need to be kicked up a little notch. You might need to add some sauce to it to get the same pleasure, or you might need another slice of it. So you see how this you know, the addiction, the addiction framework, you can't totally apply to eating, but like there are aspects of it being, you know, the aspects of like dopamine and opioids that can, that you can draw inference from, from the addiction model. Like you just like food more, you learn it and then you want more of it. And then over time it becomes really automated. So it's not, there's nothing wrong with your body. It's just your brain doing what it thinks is good for you. So these weight loss medications kind of calm that noise. I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't still need yeah. to do the work to get in tune to your body, but they help calm the noise. What are they doing physically as well? Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about like what, and I know each medication might be a little different. Yeah. Um, I do also want to address the Holozempic because we've been, we've had people been taking it to manage diabetes for years. Mm -hmm. There are a yeah. lot more medications on the market. And I think people are still caught up in the fact that Ozempic, there was a shortage for people who needed it to manage diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's no longer, that's no longer the, the truth. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, but Ozempic, so Ozempic is indicated for type two diabetes is not indicated for weight loss, though it's, um, doctors commonly before Ozempic commonly prescribe things off label. So there are a lot of patients who are using it, um, for, uh, weight loss off, off label. Right. So, so we can't really deny that. And, uh, I, but I just have to mention that Wigovi is the the brand. It's exactly the same active ingredient, semaglutide. 
um, it, that's indicated for obesity. So people are using that more and more because it's actually indicated, but the active ingredient is exactly the same. When it comes to GLP-1s, there are more than just GLP-1s on the market for weight loss, by the way. There's also something called Contrave, naltrexone slash bupropion. That's the active ingredient that is also indicated for weight loss. And then there's also other like forms of GLP-1s that are once daily injectables. But for the for the purpose of what's popular right now, once weekly injectables are what they do is the GLP, it's a mimic of a hormone that our gut actually produces. It's called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide one. And this is a, a hormone that was first discovered to, you know, signal to the pancreas, regulate blood sugar. It slows down gastric emptying, but that's not its mechanism of action. The way it works on weight loss and by diminishing hunger and increasing fullness is that it signals to this hunger center in the brain and it tells you that part of the brain you're full. You're good. Yeah. But remember, it's just one of a dozen other fullness hormones that it, it, that uh, we have. We only have access to this one of like a dozen, right? That we're mimicking. So, so it's signaling fullness. So it's actually a centrally mediated process. It's not that it's causing you to not want to eat because it's causing heartburn or like side effects like nausea. A lot of people assume that that's how it works, but that's not actually how it works. GLP-1 also anecdotally will blunt cravings, but I often find that patients who have binge eating disorder or very uncontrolled eating, if I put them on a GLP-1, they might still have this residual really like strong reward drive for tasty, tasty food. Um, that then responds really well to adding a medication like Contrave as well, right? So, so there's no, with medication similar to diet, there's no one size fits all. And I think I'll, the, one of the misconceptions is that once you get started on a GLP-1, you're good. You don't, you're done. You don't need to do anything else. That's completely untrue because a lot of people, some people don't respond to it at all. Um, and a lot of people do respond, but not everybody responds in the same way. And so that active collaboration with, you know, the lifestyle modifications, like watching what you eat, engaging in activity, all of that stuff really matters and can make a difference. Thank you for coming on because I think what people are learning is sound bites they're getting off of social media. Yeah. And I think one, there are other options other than Ozempic and you're not taking medication away from anyone. Um, there are a variety of different types that work differently. And this is why it's so important that we are informed rather than not seeking out this, this kind of treatment because you're concerned about this or concerned about that. I mean, this is why you'd want to go and see someone like Dr. Sandy Van and have a really robust conversation about options and what's going to work for you. And it's, it's not just as simple as, 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 as taking a pill or getting a shot. Um, it's not going to solve all of your issues. There is a lot of work that, that mental piece as well, changing your diet, trying to manage your stress. I would imagine yeah. factor in getting a better sleep. What do you want people to know about these, these options? I have a lot of patients who come in for these weight loss treatments and um, some of them don't even want them. Some of them just hear about them on social media. And because they've historically tried losing weight so for so long, they think that they should entertain this option of medication. <laughs> and then I tell them, I'm like, and if they're metabolically healthy, they don't have prediabetes, no cholesterol, no family history of heart disease, X, Y, and Z. You know, if there's nothing wrong with them other than the fact that they just have higher weight, um, I, I often tell them, like, what are you actually treating it for? Is it going to make you function better? Are there any mechanical limitations that it would allow you to, you know, improve? Like, is it actually, do you care? Like, it, does it change the way you see yourself? Like, a lot of these patients actually don't, they don't mind the way that they're living and nothing is impeding them except for the fact that they think that, like, because there's a treatment available, they should be on it. And they're so relieved when I tell them, you don't have to go on it. You don't have to go on a treatment just because it's there. Just continue as is and continue to work on your lifestyle modifications and adhere to those things. I have a lot of patients who want to lose just like, you know, five or 10 pounds and their body, but their body image dissatisfaction is so high, so crazy high. Um, and it's disproportionate to the weight that they're presenting with. Right. So yeah, sure. This medication is going to help you lose weight, but will that change anything about the way you see yourself? Or about that negative dialogue you wake up with every day telling you you're bad, you're fat, you're ugly. That medication doesn't change that. That is responsive to 
help from like a counselor or mindfulness-based techniques, because you can still develop self-acceptance despite whatever weight you're at and improve your quality of life in that way um, through like changes in the way you think about yourself rather than trying to change something externally that by the way, even if your weight comes down, there's no guarantee that your weight is going to remain static forever because there are other physiological processes that occur as a byproduct of time. <laughs> like, yeah, love yourself no matter what your size. Love yourself right now. Your best day is today. If you woke up and you're alive today, today is your best day. Just running out the conversation on these weight loss medications, what do you think is the amazing thing about them? And what do you think are the things that people, maybe the concerning things about them? One of the most amazing things I see about them is that they can validate people's experience. They already feel a sense of failure because uh, they've failed dieting. The opposite is true. It's that dieting actually failed them. It was never an intervention for that person to work long-term anyways. Oftentimes, if you dig a little bit deeper, they're They've got this strong family history. There were a lot of things they couldn't avoid about their, their weight, but it's hard to change body shape if you're everybody in your family has the same body shape, right? So so the the things that are amazing are, especially with these GLP-1s, that they can be incredibly validating. Once patients start on them and if they're responding well to the treatment and they start to notice, even at just a small dose, wow, the noise is a bit quieter. Whoa, I don't think about eating that second portion in the same way with the same intensity that I used to, it just allows them to understand the biological underpinnings of their appetite system, but it's the sustainability of it. It's that medication actually holding it off without the reflexive hunger and cravings um, that they really, really enjoy. What's not so amazing, there's the fact that they're cost prohibitive right now, um, that not everybody has the the privilege of being able to access them. People who deserve the treatment sometimes can't access it because their insurance companies don't cover it or because they don't have the money to budget for it. It's 250 to 500 bucks for some of these medications per month. And if yeah. you consider it to be a long-term treatment option, then you've got to budget that for how many years of your life? They're meant to be long-term treatments. They're not cures. Everybody cons considers them to be like a short-term treatment but they're meant to be long-term sort of like hypertension meds or diabetes meds. Every medication comes with um, its uh, risk of side effects. And so you've always got to weigh the risks and benefits, whether it's something that's appropriate for you. That was one of the biggest questions that we got with people who uh, are interested in taking or people who are taking, can I get off it? You can get off anything. Nothing's permanent, but, but it's more about, did you derive benefit from it? Did you see significant, clinically significant outcomes from it? Um, because those outcomes that you got are likely going to rely on long-term treatment of it. Because as soon as you withdraw treatment, your physiology goes back to what it was doing previously, right? Your appetite changes dramatically. If you got a set point that's at like 240, weight medications got you down to 190, um, and you come off of medications, it totally makes sense that your brain is like, whoa, let's recoup that. Like, let's try to get that back. There's something wrong. And that's what I mean by your brain is designed to defend against weight loss. It's not normal to lose weight and keep it off naturally. Um, but with that being said, though, I never say that it's impossible to come off these medications. But I will tell patients, like, if you're really keen to get off, maybe just trial a dose reduction instead to see how your appetite responds to that and whether you're able to sustain that um, and uh, continue to monitor, like self-monitor your your appetite, your weight changes, even the way clothes are fitting. Like if you're starting to notice changes, then you know that it, it inevitably is causing some weight regain. This is a conversation of awareness, right? It's not prescriptive. Yeah. We're not telling anyone yeah. they need to take this or do that. It really is about awareness. It's just about empowering you with knowledge to have, um, you know, conversations with your doctor. I'm so yeah. grateful for you <laughs> taking the time uh, to come on here and talk to our members. I know they are also so grateful as well. Dr. Sandy Van, thank you so much.